Coming up on Studios America, the nation is mourning the deaths of 19 young students and two teachers in Texas today. We'll give you the latest. Glenn Beck joins the program to discuss the decline of our culture and how that could have played a part in this horrific incident. And I'll touch on a few of this week's primary election winners and losers as we get closer to the midterms. Stay right where you are as we do the Uvalde shooting. I want to, uh, I guess we'll start here with the, the left and how they're trying to take advantage of this crazy uh, shooting from yesterday. I, if you stick around, I'm going to give you, I don't know, I think it's the most unbelievable statistic of gun violence in America. Maybe the most unbelievable statistic uh, in all of our public discourse. It's that incredible. We're going to debunk something really, really big about mass shootings, particularly at schools. And we'll get to that here in a second. But let me start with setting the scene as to what's happened over the past 24 hours. We know the shooting happened, as I mentioned, 21 people dead. It's, it's really, really uh, horrific. Uh, it brings us back to the Sandy Hook situation in 2012 because it was at an elementary school. So these, all of these are bad. Something that happens at an elementary school, I think, is above and beyond anything that, you know, any human can comprehend. I mean, it really is just absolutely awful. Now, the left likes to take these things and they like to take advantage of them. They like to utilize um, and, and bring uh, some sort of utility to their political movement on the backs of whoever is damaged in an incident like this. This is core to the left-wing philosophy. This is core to the Democrat Party. It, it must be done. Never let a crisis go to waste is really, really crucial to the left. And so when these things happen, immediately you go to legislation that they wanted to get passed, attacks on their opponents, um, and using some of the most disgusting tactics in all of our politics. And they've been on full display here over the past 24 hours. Let me give you, uh, first of all, the president of the United States, uh, Jolton Joe Biden. Why are we willing to live with this carnage? Why do we keep letting this happen? Where in God's name is our backbone to have the courage to deal with it and stand up to the lobbies? All right. So you get it. I can't, even, to I can't listen to too much of this today. I, I'm, I'm on the edge as it is, and I can't listen to too much of this. But you get the sense here, right? Why won't we just stand up to the lobbies, right? He says it again here. He kind of goes into uh, more about the gun lobbies. Listen. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? It's been 3,448 3, days, 10 years since I stood up at a high school in Connecticut, okay. a grade school no. in Connecticut. Okay, stop. stop. I can't. <laughs> He's talking about Sandy Hook, obviously not a high school. Um, but the point I guess I'm trying to get with these clips are Joe Biden thinks he, there's this weird idea that the left seems to want to present. And it's really, really ugly, which is, hey, we all know that we could stop kids from getting killed. It's very easy. We all have very easy plans to do it. Everyone knows how to do it. Everyone agrees this is the solution. But the gun lobby is there with their money, and therefore Republicans would rather have that money than keep kids alive. That's the basic sense here. And is there a more, uh, a more disgusting accusation in all of politics than that? I mean, it's, it's even worse than racism. It's worse than transphobia. It's worse than all that stuff. It's basically saying my political opponents want children to die at the hand of a gun because they're afraid of the gun lobby. Now, look, 
I could go through all this stuff all day. You know most of it. The gun lobby makes up a very small percentage of, of political funding. And what is the gun lobby? No one cares if the people who work at the NRA uh, are happy or sad. That's not what politicians care about. What they care about are the multiple millions of people they represent and what they care and think about. That is what the situation here is. So if... For some reason, all those millions of people really wanted bad things to happen to children in elementary schools. You could perhaps make this argument. But of course, that's not true. They just have a different view of gun rights and one that is backed by our foundations and our Constitution quite clearly. But this idea that the other people, those people on the other side, really want all these kids to die at when they're at school in a mass shooting is really revolting. Right. We can disagree as to why and how to solve these problems or if there's a way to solve them. But like we really don't agree that taking away guns from everyday law abiding citizens would help this problem. We don't. It's not that we really understand what Democrats are saying. We really think that we could fix this, but we just want those twenty thousand dollar donations to our candidates. That's not the reality here, but it's presented this way in the media and by our politicians over and over and over again. And we get to the point where and this is something really important to understand. We are in a dangerous time when it comes to politics right now. The Democrats have all the power that they need uh, on, the, on the left. And we understand the Senate issues that they have to get over the filibuster hump. But what you have is a Democrat party that is increasingly and um, overwhelmingly desperate. This is a party that realizes their future just a few months away is in real danger of evaporating for a long period of time. I talked about this the other day. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity, the next two election cycles for Republicans to change the way this country is run. And the Democrats know that. And they know in November they are in massive trouble, serious trouble as a party to hold on to control. The House is, I don't even know if they're trying for it anymore. The Senate, they're going to try to hold on to, which would give them at least the, the power to get Supreme Court justices in and such. But they're in serious, serious trouble here. And so they're becoming increasingly desperate. And no individual person on earth represents desperation like Beto O'Rourke. Now, Beto decided to show up to a press conference. I was watching the press conference at the time. And, uh, you know, uh, Governor Abbott is up there and he's giving a very somber uh, press conference, just giving the details, talking about what this shooter wound up putting on Facebook beforehand, the uh, heroic efforts of law enforcement, the the mental health struggles that, that are coming for this community as they try to get through this and how the resources will be there. And then Beto, who only the only thing he cares about on Earth is Beto. There is that's it. This is a guy who live streams himself driving down the street to believe that this has anything to do with caring about kids being shot is completely ridiculous. He only cares about himself and decided to stand up. And what's, I think, fascinating about this moment more than anything else is think about how we got here. At some point in the last 24 hours, Beto O'Rourke had a meeting with his staff and said, hey, how do I take advantage of these dead children? How do I make this about me? How do I improve my political prospects in the next 24 hours? How do I drag the narrative to my campaign? How do I turn this into millions of dollars? And what they landed on is what you're about to see. In the middle of this press conference, Beto O'Rourke, the cringiest of people on God's green earth, decides to stand up and interrupt the press conference. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sit down. You're out of you're out of line and an embarrassment. Sit down. I don't like this. The next shooting is right now, and you are doing nothing. No, he needs to get his ass out of here. This isn't the place to talk to this over. This is totally predictable when you. Sir, you're out of line. Sir, you are out of line. Sir, you are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. I can't believe you're a sick son of a that would come to a deal like this to make a political issue.
Mm -hmm. That's the mayor, by the way, of the town who's in the middle of dealing with this tragedy, who has to sit here and yell at this buffoon from stage because Beto O'Rourke is the lowest political form possible, the lowest common denominator of all citizens ever involved in politics in the United States. He is such an utter embarrassment in every single way and also dumb. Can we put that out of the table? Beto O'Rourke is an idiot. Beyond the fact that it's disgusting what he's trying to do to drag the cameras to himself, where he wound up doing another little talky talk with a bunch of reporters outside of this hall, he, d despite how disgusting this is when they're in the middle of telling people how to get resources in their community in the middle of a tragedy, despite the fact that he did all of that, it's also so dumb. In the middle of this, he stands up, he makes a big deal of himself, then gets dragged off, and then leaves his opponent, who's there with the microphone, and the entire audience nationwide, to sit here and talk about what's really going on. And both Abbott and Dan Patrick handled it very well, and wound up saying, look, this, you know, this is not about politics, and they looked much more above it. You don't, look, I mean, it's a basic, basic idea here. You don't, you, don't, you don't interrupt something like that and then leave your opponents with the microphones. I mean, the, the guy's just an idiot in every single way. So he goes through and does his really dumb crap. Um, we also saw a lot of uh, people in, in, uh, on social media, celebrities, entertainers, people in sports, uh, doing their same type of thing, this preening response where they know, everyone knows how we stop this. You, you guys just don't want to stop it. I don't know. What, I just can't believe you people. Here's uh, Steve Kerr with his uh, very emotional response to this. Since we left shoot around, 14 children were killed 400 miles from here. And a, and a teacher. And in the last 10 days, we've had elderly black people killed in a supermarket in Buffalo. We've had Asian churchgoers killed in Southern California. And now we have children murdered at school. When are we going to do something? I'm tired. I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences to to the devastated families that are out there. I'm so tired of the excuse. Me, I'm sorry. I'm tired of the moments of silence. Enough. There's 50 senators right now who refuse to vote on HR8, which is a background check rule that the House passed a couple of years ago. It's been sitting there for two years. I just can't and there's a reason they won't vote on it, to hold on to power. Well, let me guess. So I ask you, mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell, I ask all of you senators who refuse to do anything about the violence and school shootings and supermarket shootings, I ask you, are you going to put your own desire for power ahead of the lives God, of our children tough. and our oh. elderly and our churchgoers? Because that's what it looks like. I, I don't even know. I mean, it's so stupid. The shooter went through a background check. Having universal background checks is not going to double background check him. He's not going to be background checked out of this issue. This background check bill has nothing to do with this incident whatsoever. He literally went through a background check. To advocate for a universal background check bill to stop someone who went through a background check is quite possibly the dumbest thing anyone has ever done since the Beto O'Rourke clip I just showed you. But this is what they do constantly, constantly, constantly. So, oh, by the way, I should point this out. Steve Kerr, th this is a guy who, you know, look, he's had a crazy life. His parents were, I believe his dad was killed. At one point, I mean, look, maybe his emotions are getting the best of him. And part of this is the dumb response that comes from the left is a lot of people just don't know how to deal with this, right? I mean, look, this is in inherent evil. And the fact that you have to watch this go happen over and over again is really, really tough for everybody uh, to deal with. So to, to, to react uh, emotionally and stupidly is, is somewhat forgivable, especially for someone who's like Steve Kerr, who nobody thinks is, you know, a scholar. Uh, he's just a guy who's out there, you know, he's a basketball coach and, 
and he's making the stuff up as he goes along. I can tell you that's true because, uh, as Clay Travis uh, points out, Steve Kerr, who last night demanded new gun laws to keep kids safe, protested to demand the removal of all armed police from school two years ago. Uh, and fact check him if you want. Here it is. War, uh, this is the headline. Warriors Kerr backs effort to remove police from Oakland schools. This is in June 2020. And if you might remember what was going on in June 2020, the thing of that day was George Floyd and police are bad and they can't do anything. And we hate police. So when that was going on, Steve Kerr wanted them out of schools. However, now that the thing is that someone got, was shot in, uh, in, in the, we had a shooter in a school. Now we all love the police where we love the heroic efforts and thank God they were there, but that's not enough. We need something else. This is not real analysis. This is not real thought. This is idiotic rambling from people who don't know what they're talking about and who people who would have made this situation much, much, much worse. The fact that there was an actual school, uh, school resource officer, a, an armed guard, essentially a police officer there, made a big difference. This is how the very beginning of this incident played out from ABC News. At some point in the morning, officials say an 18-year-old man shot his own grandmother in her home and then drove toward Robb Elementary School near the center of town. He's making a scene. He crashes his car, comes out wearing a backpack, and holding an AR-15-style rifle. The suspect starts making his way toward the front door, and there he's confronted by a police officer who he shot. The police officer fired back, but that's when it became apparent that the suspect was wearing body armor. Now, this incident obviously, at the very least, delays the shooter from getting into the building. And what's fascinating about this, and we should also add on, when he shot his grandmother in the face, by the way, the grandmother was somehow able to also call police and alert them, and they showed up right after this incident. Uh, but who knows? It could have been considerably worse if there was not someone there. If the Steve Kerr policy were in place at this school, this incident would have been much, much worse. All of this is to say that this is a really difficult issue for people to handle because what I'm about to tell you is the worst hot take in history. Everyone says, you know what, we just need to be able to do something. If we just did something, we could stop these things. And here's the thing. You're never going to be able to stop these things. You can minimize some of them. You can stop some of them. You can do certain things around the margins. You can catch some people before these things happen. And the, of course, the problem with that approach is you'll never know that you're doing that. You'll never know that you stopped a real shooter because tons of kids, tons and tons and tons of kids have bad posts on, on social media. Tons of them act out. Tons of them are depressed. Tons of them are bullied. All that stuff exists, and you're looking for a needle in a haystack. The one person who acts like this shooter, who, by the way, I will not tell you their name. We know that this shooter wound up posting things on Facebook right as this was going on. We know that they posted pictures of guns, all the sort of things you'd think would trip a red flag law. However, that's, of course, one of the pushes that we're getting now. We need more red flag laws. But it was just a couple of weeks ago in Buffalo where they had red flag laws in place and did not catch this particular shooter. And look, here's a guy who wound up killing or trying to kill, I think, I believe she's still in critical condition, his grandmother, we think she's going to uh, live at this point, but uh, if she had guns in the house, it wouldn't matter if you stopped this guy from buying guns. If, he, if he's willing to kill a relative with guns, he can get guns. That's the way this works. It's, it's very, very difficult for people to handle. And the, 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 the problem here is that we've had, uh, there is evil out there. There are people who will do terrible things. We've come a long, long way from the medieval times. <laughs> we, I mean, watch any show about those days. It's sort of filled with violence. We've come a long, long way. If you read Steven Pinker's work, for example, you can, you can see that in, in very vivid detail. We've come a long way to minimize violence in our society, but you can't make it go away. And here's where I want to just, Maybe set your mind at ease a little bit, because if you have kids in this uh, in this uh, age group, if you have kids in high school, if you have relatives, if you if you if you think you might be going to a grocery store anytime soon and you hear the coverage of this, it makes it feel like these things are happening all the time. And we have seen an uptick in violence over the past couple of years as compared uh, post uh, George Floyd uh, and covid. We have seen an uptick over the past couple of years. That's true. But to keep things in perspective, it, you have to look at the whole picture here. 
And school shootings, while they make a lot of noise and people talk about them and it feels, it really does feel like we're dealing with these things all the time. We're dealing with these tragedies all the time. You turn on the TV and just another 10 kids are dead at a school somewhere and it, it's just awful. It's just awful and that's all true. But here I think is what you need to know because the media is going to try to make you feel emotional. They're going to try to push you down these roads to make rash decisions about policy and your rights. And you need to know what the facts are. The peak of school shootings in this country over the past 30 years was the year I graduated high school. That year was 1994. Not last year, not five years ago. 1994. Look at me. Do, does it look like I recently graduated high school? Probably not. Here's the chart to show you exactly the truth here. Now, this goes through uh, 2015 in this particular chart, but there have not been a, a rise uh, above the Sandy Hook level uh, school uh, shooting levels uh, since then. And what you see is that we have a major downtrend since the mid 90s. And if you think, OK, well, that's the only number of school shootings. What we have seen uh, is bigger ones, right? Maybe back then there were more incidents of school shootings, a few people getting killed, a couple people getting killed and I don't know, gang violence or whatever. But now we have these big spectacular shootings. And that's true. Again, those are not a new phenomenon, but are a more uh, they occur more often. This idea that you go for attention and stream your shooting and all of that stuff is obviously new on, in many ways. But here is just the students killed per million graph from the mid 90s. And I know we're in Chartapalooza land here, but what you see is that I, Stu Bergier, were much more at risk of dying in a school shooting back when I was in school than kids are today. You see the only recent peak on this chart is the Sandy Hook year, and you'd see a recent peak, uh, a, a similar peak uh, for um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in, I think this was 2018, and you're gonna see, unfortunately, another one this year because of this incident. But what we've seen overall is a large, large decrease in deaths in these type of incidents over the years. And I say, I say this to people all the time and no one can believe it. Yeah, you were more risk 30 years ago to die in a school shooting if you were at school. That is just a fact, completely true, no matter what the media is telling you. It's not an epidemic. This is not a thing where we, uh, you know, where we have these constant common events, even though it feels that way. And that's not me saying that. That's researchers at Northeastern University. Quote, this is not an epidemic. Mass school shootings are incredibly rare events. So what do you do with this information? Do you do nothing? No, you don't do nothing. You try to do everything that you can. But you have to realize that grabbing low-hanging fruit uh, is going to be much more effective than trying to do what Democrats are doing. Even if it was going to be successful, which I would argue it wouldn't, to, to put in gun control measures, you have the Constitution standing in your way. So do what you actually mean. If you actually want to, to do these things, then propose to the American people that you want to overturn the Second Amendment. And go for it. See how it works for you. Maybe, maybe the American people will embrace it. I don't know. But when that's there, you should try to do things that are much easier and lower hanging fruit. These are the things that Republicans and Democrats do agree on, things like mental health and securing schools. You can do those things. It's not going to prevent all of these uh, situations, but at least it will do something. And that's the problem. That's not the goal of the left. Doing something to solve this problem is not the goal of the left. The goal is to upend our foundations, to take your guns to make this into an issue that they can, as a desperate party in desperate times, can do something to help themselves. That, unfortunately, is the story. Glenn Beck is going to talk about this coming up next. Well, legend has it that there once was a line of fashionable and customizable belts, cool belts made in America by a great company at a reasonable price. And those legends, my friends, 
are true. Yes, Grip6.com slash stew is the place to go to check it out. If you've never been to Grip6.com, take a minute and check uh, this company out. It's a small company in Utah. They sell all around the world. They source everything here in America, though. Uh, they're minimalist belts. They've got really cool designed wallets. Wallets, I mean, you're going to look at these things and be like, oh, I've never even seen a wallet that looks like that before. Made by, you know, made out of different materials, even like wood. And you're thinking like, a wood wallet? Yeah, check these things out. Go see them. Grip6.com slash stew. If you use the code stew, you'll save 15%. They have great socks. They've got wallets. They've got the belts. Grip, the number six, dot com slash stew. Grip6.com slash stew. Get 15% off today. I'm joined once again by Glenn Beck. He has a brand new special coming up next at 9 p.m. Eastern. Make sure to check that one out. Uh, Glenn, welcome. Welcome back. It's great to see you, as always, and I appreciate your enthusiastic appearance. You know, and, um, and this is a crappy, crappy show. Okay, you can always tell. You can always tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you can tell just by who they can get as guests. All right, tonight I have Mark Levin. I have guest. Ali Stuckey. Great guest. Uh, I have uh, William Barr on tomorrow. Good guest. You got. A, you got a great. Who do you have? I rest my case. <laughs> okay, uh, guess that proves this show sucks. Yeah, right? uh, welcome to the show. Right, thank that you. sucks. Mm -hmm. um, your show tonight is, uh, it's not actually about the shooting, although it's sort of tied to that. It is. It, um, it's about replacement theory, but not the replacement theory that the left has been talking about, the real replacement theory mm. that is going on in our society. Um, and uh, we're replacing tried and true stuff with a bunch of garbage <laughs> and we're experimenting on our kids we are chasing god out and look what's happening to society there is a replacement theory that is being engaged right now um, and that's why we're in so much trouble hmm. and it's not something anybody will talk about it's just something completely different than what the media is accusing yeah of. right um, so let's go to that because you're talking about what the the culture, the traditional values All that the, we've had. Everything. I mean, Stu, we got rid of prayer and Bibles in schools in what 1962. Okay, so we get rid of that and we don't replace it with anything. Nature abhors a vacuum. Mm -hmm. What have we replaced God with? A new God, a new God, um, and look at where we're at. We, we are telling our kids, oh, your gender? No, that's fluid. You can, you, whatever you are, mm -hmm. whatever you, you want to be. I'm right. just thinking of Ricky Gervais saying, I could have my legs cut off, I could put two wheels where my stumps are, and I could, I could call myself a pram, and <laughs> you'd be the bigot for pointing out that I'm not. <laughs> um, you know, nothing has meaning, nothing has value. There are no traditions that are worthy in America. There is no God. I think you're going to have these problems. Uh, the reaction I've heard from the left on this, on, particularly as it ties to the shooting in Texas yesterday, is look at what conservatives have done. Here they are focusing on CRT and gender and abortion and all this stuff. Wait, hang on just a second. We're not focused on that. We're responding to that. Yeah. Because they're focused on it. Right, yes, true. Uh, but they are important things to focus on, and, yes. uh, and we should focus on them. But they think, th what it's presented as is there's this thing, this, this problem we all understand exists. And we all, deep down, really know how to stop it. We could do it easily, but we don't do it because of the gun lobby or money going to politicians or... Can you please explain who the gun lobby is? And how they have any power with well, ESG? NRA, right? NRA is it has been defanged by the left. Okay, um, the gun lobby. Besides the NRA, which have you heard from them lately? Who's the gun lobby that they're so worried about? Okay, um, it's millions of Americans. Who that's want to own the guns, gun lobby. Right? Yeah. There's f over 400 million guns in the United States. You know that that's a lot of guns. I don't know if anybody's counting. Um, it's not compared to the deficit, but for guns, it's enormous. How are you going to take those away? That's the gun lobby. The Americans that understand, you're not screwing with the Second Amendment. 
No, you're not screwing with the first, second, third, tenth, any of them. You're not screwing with the Constitution. Um, you you want to pass an amendment, that's a different subject. Get that by. But you're not going to regulate us out. That's the only gun lobby. And quite honestly, if you could convince me that you've done everything else and this would work, you showed me evidence that this would work, we could have a conversation. And it would end with me saying, okay, if I believed in it, which I doubt I would, but if mm -hmm. I believed in it, I'd say, okay, let's get a constitutional amendment. Let's do this right. Okay? They can't tell you any stats uh, that show you this is going to work. They won't even look at the cause. They'll, they will tell us that uh, the fentanyl coming across the border, stop worrying about that. It killed 106,000 people 18 to 49. Imagine if we had 106,000 gun deaths, okay? I think they'd care about it. These are killing our kids exactly the same way, except it's not another kid, it's a you know, drug cartel, mm -hmm. okay? They don't care about that. They're not trying to close down the border. They're not, you know, eager for the drug war. Why? This is only power. It, it does seem that way because, it, as you point out, there's a constitutional barrier to, to, to implement the solutions they believe would work, right? Correct. If you believe them. Uh, that you want to take guns away from people. There is a major problem with that because there's a huge constitutional hurdle. And yes, you'd have to amend the Constitution to do the things that they want to do. Where like something like fentanyl, you don't, right? Like you don't have to amend the Constitution to attack that problem. Yet they seem much less concerned with a larger number uh, much, larger. much larger. I mean, when we talk about you know school shootings, everyone's like, "Oh gosh, well we sh we had the school shooting in St Sandy Hook, and we didn't do anything." First of all, there's been hundreds of gun laws that have been passed since mm -hmm. that. It just hasn't stopped them, which is what we said would happen. Mm -hmm. But we you also had uh, Marjorie Taylor, not Marjorie Taylor Green, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, High School, uh, another major shooting. But those are you know you, those those three shootings are three in a decade there were others of smaller scale but those are the three that we point to and it's like well when you're in a country of 330 million people can you prevent with any selection of laws can you prevent one school shooting per year like no. I, i'd love to but is it even possible no it's not and it's not because of access of guns it's because replacement theory we have replaced God, reason, decency, sanity. We've replaced all of those things with things that are meaningless. Our kids are committing suicide. They didn't care to look at that. They didn't want to open up the schools. They were in isolation, and we have record suicide rates. Hmm. Why didn't they care? Why didn't they say, we have got to get these kids back in? I told a story on radio today that Michaela is in Florida. She's on our staff. She went down to Florida. She was in the Melbourne Zoo yesterday, and they have some birds or whatever in the zoo, and they were let out. And she was talking to the guy about the birds, and he said, yeah, we're really kind of concerned about them um, because bird flu is all over in this area. And we wanted to keep them safe, but we just thought it would be really unhealthy for them to be isolated and inside. <laughs> the birds. The birds. Uh -huh. The birds. Mm -hmm. Where was anybody saying that about humans? Our kids. I, they clearly are only doing this. I mean, look, do you think things would have been better or worse if the federal government and the state governments were not afraid of an uprising, an armed uprising uh, during COVID? Do you think things would have been better or worse if mm -hmm. we didn't have just a little bit of hesitation from the politicians on, no, they'll revolt. Yeah, and a lot of guns were sold during COVID, Correct. partially for that reason. Correct. So how much of this relates to, to COVID? Because, you know, we, we talked about earlier on the show the decrease in even school shooting deaths since when I was in high school. I mean, they're, they're down. They're not up. This isn't an epidemic. This isn't happening all the time. It feels like it is, but it's not. I mean, it's just you have a much better chance of survival now than you did when I was in high school. And that's hard to understand, but it's just plainly true. But 
we have seen an uptick from those low levels since COVID. How much of this is you take people, you take, you destroy their lives, you destroy their livelihoods, you put them in a place where they're not able to go see their doctors, you lock them up for months, you screw with their mental health like crazy, and then you release them all into the, into the wild. How much of this is, how much of more of this stuff should we expect as sort of a, a, an echoing effect from that whole So fiasco? I think you make a good case, but I think a stronger case, I think that plays a role, mm-hmm. but I think a stronger case can be made with the other experiment we've been doing with people. Tell them there's no hope, mm. there's no future, the planet is dying, mm. um, people are expendable, shout your abortion even after the baby's dead. Imagine how that makes kids feel that mom made a choice to not kill me a week after birth. Yay? <laughs> okay. How, how expendable are people, uh, are people on that? Um, then you, you divide everybody into categories and you turn them against each other. And you say through social media, hey, by the way, if they've made you feel bad, we're going to de-person, uh, deperson them. We're going to, we'll dehumanize them. They're not really human. They don't have a right to do that. What do you think is going to happen? Of course people are going to start shooting. Every single one we looked at, I'm, I'm going back in the record here in the last five years, and yeah. I'm going to look at all the shootings tomorrow on radio. I'm telling you, I'll bet you they all stem. If you want to look for a pattern, they all stem from I was I was wronged by my my uh, kids in my school. They always made fun of me. They bullied me. Uh, is is social media is that anti bullying? Mm, no. Uh, there's the biggest bully on the block. Uh, you know, they, they um, made me feel bad because I was Muslim, because I wasn't Muslim, because I was black, because I wasn't black, because I wore, you know, uh, clothes for, of poor people. And it's these damn rich people that were holding me back. I'll bet you that it's the grievance acts that has been sharpened. Mm. So is there a, a solution? I think that... Part of this is we have to make the uncomfortable realization that more of this is going to exist than you want to exist. You're never going to get this to zero, and this sort of stuff is going to happen. However, is there something we can do to cut it by 20%, to cut it by 50%, to, to, to reduce these days? We have to talk about this. No, not, a, not unless we're willing to really have a conversation. That's Tonight, I'm going to have that conversation. I had a little bit of it on radio today. Yeah. What's the real problem here? Um, And the real problem is there's a hole in our souls. Um, Imagine being a kid growing up today. What what is real? What isn't real? You know, your your friends are online and you're not. We, We have no idea just the impact of that alone. Mm. Then your gender doesn't matter. Your family doesn't matter. Your parents don't matter. Your mom was was wrestling whether or not to kill you or not. And importantly, there's no higher power to Correct. look forward an internal solution to Correct. these issues. There is no one saying you can rise above. There's something bigger to strive for. And it's not the planet and it's not the government. There is a plan for your life. I don't care. I mean, Jordan Peterson used to talk about God. He wasn't a believer in God. Um, And he used to talk about the importance of God in a society and those stories. Even if it's all bull crap, it builds people to have hope. Where's the hope that is being taught? All right, Glenn Beck, the special is tonight. Don't miss it. Uh, it is right after this program, if you're watching on Blaze TV. One that I have, a, I have good guests, okay? I'm just saying, I have good guests on tonight's show. It's not like this crap I'm, show. I'm, a, I'm available if you have an open slot. I could pop on and oh, talk about Oh, jeez, we're all out of time. I gotta go, oh, Stu. Okay, uh, blazetv.com slash Stu is the place to go to get your subscription. Use the promo code Stu to save 10 bucks. Glenn, thanks.
Listen, you don't really want to get your news from a bunch of overpaid, overweight morons uh, reading celebrity tweets and liberal talking points off a prompter, do you? I mean, if you do, I mean, CNN Plus has already been canceled, so you're screwed there. However, if you're interested in hearing the truth and opinions from people who matter and only some of which are overweight, then you need a subscription to Blaze TV today. We've got the best people in conservative media, Glenn Beck, Stephen Crowder, Chad Prather, Mark Levin, tons more. Uh, don't miss out on news and commentary that you need to drown out the useless mainstream media noise. Head to blazetv.com slash stew right now. Enter the promo code stew. You'll score 10 bucks off your subscription. It's blazetv.com slash stew. The promo code is stew. All right, if you're buying or selling a home, you know what the market is like right now, and it can be really, really rough if you're not working with the right agent. Uh, generally speaking, our homes are our biggest investment. That's a lot of responsibility, and you need an agent who's going to take that seriously. That's why I always talk to you about realestateagentsitrust.com. Don't just take anybody. Take the best agent from your area, realestateagentsitrust.com. They work with the best. Uh, they do their homework. They talk to every agent before inviting them to join the network. And they only work with full-time professionals. The team makes the introduction and then follows you through the buying or selling process to make sure that you're actually satisfied. The process is simple. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com, give us a little bit of uh, info, get you all set up where you are, and they'll uh, make the contact to the best real estate agent in your area. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Primary night was sort of overshadowed last night with everything going on, but let me give you a few highlights. Uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is going to be the Republican nominee for a governor in Arkansas, and she will likely be, you know, almost definitely will be the uh, governor of Arkansas following in her father's footsteps, of course. Um, Ken Paxton defeated George P. Bush in the runoff here in Texas, which means there's no more Bushes in Texas that are in public office, which is like not a thing Texas seems to be able to do. Apparently now they did. Ken Paxton holds on to his role there. Alabama was a really interesting one. We talked about it going in a three-way race. Um, Mo Brooks had been endorsed by Trump. Then he pulled his endorsement in March. And then after he pulled his endorsement, inexplicably, Mo Brooks started rising in the polls. And now uh, he wound up getting uh, all the way to second place and wound up finishing uh, with enough to uh, get to a runoff against Katie Britt. Now, this is going to be uphill, I think, at some level for Mo Brooks and that Katie Britt was at 45 or 46 percent. Uh, so she's pretty close to 50. It's, you know, Brooks is going to have to work hard to, to win that runoff, but he's got a shot here, and it'll be a very interesting one. And then in Georgia, sort of the marquee state, Herschel Walker uh, won, Marjorie Taylor Greene won her congressional race. No real surprise in either one of those two races. The sort of big surprise was uh, in, at the governor's side, which was a, a big blowout, big, much bigger than expected, uh, where Brian Kemp beat uh, David Perdue by about 50 points. Now, this, when Trump endorsed Purdue, everybody, I think, thought this was going to be, at the very least, a very close race. It was not close at all. Uh, and Brad Raffensperger avoided a runoff, and this was actually not really predicted by anybody that I saw. Uh, he, he was the guy who was sort of the face of the Georgia election, saying, look, we looked into this, and there, the fraud that you're saying isn't here. We don't have any evidence of it, and we're not changing these votes. Uh, he, he was he was kind of the face of that. And he got over 50 percent and held off a challenge from a Trump endorsed uh, um, opponent as well. And so in the 14th district of Georgia, you had Marjorie Taylor Greene, Brad Raffensperger and Brian Kemp. All they voted for all three of them. They disagreed on almost everything, but they voted for all three of them. I guess that's the power of incumbency. Back in a second. Glenn Beck special, blazetv.com slash stew, promo code is stew, is coming up uh, here in just a second. Don't miss it. And we'll have all the details on what's going on in Texas as well on tomorrow's radio program. And then back here tomorrow. See you then.